Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the content patch for the 11th of January 2013. My name is Total Biscuit with today's gaming news and comment. Coming up in the show, Microsoft reveals the Xbox Illumi Room concept. The IGF 2013 award finalists have been announced. Developers react to the unveiling of Project Shield. Daisy standalone delay has finally been explained with closed beta on the way. And Pokemon X and Y announced for 3DS. Microsoft Research has unveiled a device at CES by the name of the Illumi Room, which uses a combination of a connect and a projector to place effects upon the walls and around the room in which you are playing a video game. The system itself is designed to work with your television, allowing elements of the game to actually escape the TV in some kind of ambient form. So let's say there's a lot of flashes going on on the screen. What you will find with the Illumi Room is that a lot of those those flashes say muzzle flash and ambient lighting and so on and so forth is actually spread throughout the room using the actual projector. The connect is used to scan the room and presumably is also used as a relative position point for the projector to work from in order to provide you with these effects. The demonstration video that you're seeing in the background is not necessarily representative of what this thing will actually do, but the device is designed to allow further immersion into video games and to apparently blur the lines between on-screen content and the environment we live in, at least according to the statement from Microsoft Research. There is currently no more information available about the device and Microsoft Research has stated that further information will be coming your way at the CHI 2013 event in Paris on the 27th of April. Hmm, well, interesting looking device, certainly an interesting concept. I mean, there's parts of it that look pretty cool and there are other elements of it which seem to be somewhat superfluous. I mean, technically, if you're totally honest, the entire bloody thing is entirely superfluous. It's the notion of giving you additional lighting effects outside of your television screen, but something that would catch within your peripheral vision. Is that useful in any way? Probably not. The only time it really is going to be used to display anything in the game UI itself would be when the game was very specifically programmed with that in mind. And even then, you don't want too many elements projected around the room because, of course, you're focusing on the television. There are, I believe, certain limited situations where you could place objects in the peripheral vision, have it outside of the normal television FOV, and that might be useful, possibly. But really, that's only theoretical. That's very much speculation. The demonstration video primarily shows the device being used to cast lighting effects around the room. So say if you happen to have an energy sword or whatever, then you swing that around, the lighting effects actually project around the room. It's nice. I mean, it's a cool idea, but it is, of course, a fairly expensive one. I mean, there's no real chance that anyone's going to turn around and buy a projector for the sole purpose of using the Illumi room. That is not going to happen. I think we can safely say that, but if you already have a projector and a connect, then that's a little optional thing for you. I certainly think it's a cool idea. I certainly think that there's the possibility of more immersion in video games by using a device like this, but I can't really see the practical applications from gameplay standpoints. I can't see it linking in with game mechanics in any way, and I can't see any kind of new gaming experiences arising from this device and system simply because it is almost purely cosmetic. The actual in-game uses of it are very limited, and even if they were implemented, they may very well not be implemented correctly. Let's just bear in mind, of course, that we are talking about a device that uses the Kinect here, a device that has universally failed in terms of the ability to provide enhancements to traditional gaming experiences, and any attempts that have been put into place to do that have failed utterly up to this point. So, as far as I'm concerned, it's a nice little gimmick. And I think that might actually be the correct use of the word gimmick this time around. It's a nice little gimmick. If you have a projector, if you have a connect, it looks pretty cool. But it's certainly not something that I personally would go out of my way to use by any stretch of the imagination. And of course, it is only still in concept. It's by Microsoft Research. This thing might not even come out. 
The 15th annual Independent Games Festival is on its way and is coming to you on March the 25th through to the 29th in San Francisco, California, and it has announced its finalists for the main competition. The IGF Awards feature nearly $60,000 in prizes, and a big change this year is that the competition finalists receive the opportunity to accept a Steam distribution deal. Admittedly, this doesn't apply to half of the games in the list, since they are already on Steam, but it's certainly a nice option for those not wishing to roll the dice on green light. So what are the categories? Well, we've got excellence in visual art, excellence in narrative, technical excellence, excellence in design, excellence in audio, the Nouveau Award, as well as the Sumas McNally Grand Prize. Let's roll down some of the nominations. So in excellence in visual art, we've got Incredipede, which of course I have played on the channel. You can go check out the WTF is of that. Kentucky Route Zero, Guacamole, Lovers in a Dangerous Space time as well as your walk. Excellence in Narrative has 30 Flights of Lovin', also a game that I've played in the channel. Cart Life, Kentucky Route Zero, which seems to be picking up quite a few nods at the moment. Dysphoria and Gone Home. In the category of Technical Excellence, we have Starforge, Perspective, Little Inferno, Intrusion 2, once again a game that I've played on the channel, and Liquid Sketch. Excellence in Design features Samurai Gun, FTL Faster Than Light, a game that I've played a hell of a lot of, Star Seed Pilgrim, Super Hexagon, and Super Space. In Excellence in Audio, there's Kentucky Route Zero, Bad Hotel, 140, Pixel Junk 4AM, and of course Hotline Miami. Actually, almost kind of disappointed not to see FTL in there, as it had a great soundtrack, but it's hard to argue with the inclusion of Hotline Miami. The Nouveau Award is designed to honor abstract and unconventional game development, so chances are you haven't heard of any of these. Actually, no, you'll have heard of one of them. There's Cart Life, Space Team, Dysphoria, Bentet Let. Seven Grand Steps, Mirror Moon, Vespa 5, and Little Inferno. And the Grand Prize finalists consist of Hotline Miami, FTL, Cart Life, Little Inferno, and Kentucky Route Zero, which I'm becoming increasingly more interested in considering the number of nominations it's actually had. There is a further category in the form of the IGF Audience Award, and the voting for that will be kicking off in early February. If you're looking for more information on the Independent Games Festival, then you can check it out over at igf.com that is igf.com a few days after the announcement of nvidia's project shield developers have been reacting to the system in a rather unsurprising announcement it would appear that meteor games are steadfastly behind it considering they developed a version of their forthcoming mech game hawken for the system to demonstrate during the press conference it's been indicated that Hawkin will most likely be exclusive to the Tegra 4 and may be a Project Shield exclusive being made unavailable on other Android devices, which would not be entirely inconceivable, especially considering the fact that you need a real controller for the thing. Other comments have come from Epic's Mark Rain that claims that the Project Shield is an uncompromising high-performance console experience, although it may also be unsurprising that they are getting support from Epic since both Hawkin and Real Boxing, which was demonstrated during the press conference are both Unreal Engine games, and there is a larger push for Unreal Engine games to be developed upon the Android and iOS platform. Yves Guillemot, the CEO of Ubisoft, also commented that they are excited about new hardware developments and Project Shield promises to bring both mobile and PC gamers a great new gaming experience. Needless to say, however, it is not without its doubters, including the CEO of Sony himself, Kaz Hiri, who stopped short of directly criticizing the platform, but said he wasn't surprised by the announcement and that they were hardly the first company to try and break in to the dedicated mobile gaming device platform, which he stated was a very difficult thing to do. Dean Hall, better known to DayZ fans as Rocket, has come out of seclusion to talk a little bit about the forthcoming DayZ standalone release that was scheduled to come out at the end of 2012. However, this needless to say did not happen, and he tries to explain why in a fairly in-depth blog post. He claims that the reason the standalone has not been released yet is that they were able to go from essentially improving the mod slightly and releasing it in a simple package to thoroughly redeveloping and remaking the the actual game itself. He goes on to describe a number of different features including a complete overhaul to the inventory system which has been torn out of the game and completely replaced with a new and better one which includes the ability to scavenge for items as individual parts. 
This, of course, in itself implies that crafting will be a fairly large part of the Daisy standalone and also the ability to add on components to various different devices, as well as account for things like batteries and consumable power sources. He also stated that items on a player that you attack can be damaged. So the example that he gave was if you shot a player in the head to take his night vision, you would damage the night vision in the process. He also claims there are huge usability improvements that have been made in terms of the inventory management for the game, which includes the addition of a drag and drop as well as full 3D models. Improvements to the overall graphical fidelity as well as sweeping UI changes are also in effect, and they are continuing to work on the map. However, the lead designer of the map, Ivan Bukta, is still imprisoned in Greece, so is actually providing assistance via the medium of letters. Jesus, I mean, this is just the very notion of that is absurd. Just a reminder, by the way, those guys are still in prison. Just if you'd forgotten, I'm just going to keep reminding you every now and again as just to how utterly ridiculous that situation is. Anyway, I could not be happier with the fact that they are delaying this. As it has been said many times before, the game is only delayed until it comes out. A bad game is bad forever. But in this case, I think that the War Z drama has put a very bright spotlight on the notion that if you release an incomplete game on Steam, people will get very, very upset with you. And the last thing you want is the Daisy standalone to come along and be just as buggy and a goddamn mess like War Z. Now, I've been accused of many things. The most odd thing that I've been accused of is being a Daisy fanboy. I just want to point out the only time I ever really played Daisy in any serious fashion was with the developer himself. It was actually with Dean Hall, and that was for the purposes of making a video because I wanted to interview the guy. And this all actually came about from the fact that I'd done an interview at E3 and the footage got lost. So I decided, hey, let's let's do a better one. So I talked to him and he was really willing to do that. So that's the only reason I played the game to begin with. I actually am not a big fan of the game itself. I like the concept behind it. And this is the thing. I feel that a lot of people like the concept behind Daisy and the War Z. But the implementation so far has been fairly poor. The only reason Daisy gets away with it, whereas War Z does not, is that Daisy is a very clearly marked free mod in alpha for a different game whereas the War Z was released at a price point and had a fully functional in-game marketplace. It was also described as release 1.0 and the foundation release. That is why War Z got hammered as hard as it did, and that is why Daisy gets away with some of that. Not that Daisy has been without criticism, and rightfully so, as far as I'm concerned, it has a lot of problems, not least of which, of course, is the ability to hack the game very easily. However, this is a situation that they can get out of by releasing a good standalone. So my hope is that they take as much time as they require. There is really very little threat from the War Z at this point. It has been utterly steamrolled. It's not on Steam anymore. Its play account has tumbled over the past couple of weeks based on the statistics available on the Steam charts. And quite frankly, the developers are crazy nut jobs. So as far as I'm concerned, he has nothing to worry about. Absolutely nothing. What he will have to deal with if he releases the game too early is the outright fury and indignation of the community. Would you want that? No, of course not. That's insanity. Please, for the love of God, do not do that. I think, honestly, the man is too smart for that. So we'll see how this turns out. I feel that the blog post was very well written. It was certainly very humble and very descriptive. So there's little for me to complain about there, but... I think he, more so than anyone, is fully aware that there is a very bright spotlight indeed on this genre right now, and to release a game in anything less than a close to perfect state would result in an awful lot of drama. And finally, the first in the main series of Pokemon games has finally been announced for the 3DS. Pokemon X and Y are coming to the device with a brand new 3D perspective, as opposed to the usual top-down sprite-based gameplay of the previous titles. Pokemon X and Y is anticipated to arrive on the 3DS in October and has been stated by Nintendo as a continuation of the series rather than a reimagining, regardless of the fact that the game is in a significantly different perspective and features for the first time in the main series full 3D graphics. Of course, previous games such as Pokemon Stadium and Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness have featured such things, but this is the first time that the main series has had 3D graphics in this 
this way. The visuals, as you can probably see in the background, use a fairly cell-shaded style with the uh, black outlines. Indeed, it actually very much reminds me of Dragon Quest VIII, which is certainly by no means a bad thing. Uh, the game actually looks fairly impressive for the 3DS hardware, one of the more impressive-looking titles on that particular system. However, as a purist, I have to say that anything past the original 151 Pokemon is a lie, and as such, this game must be taking place in some kind of alternate reality, where Pokemon get progressively more boring and ubiquitous the further on in the series you actually get. I mean, seriously. How are these starting Pokemon even remotely close to being as awesome as the starting three in the original? Bulbasaur, Squirtle, Charmander. They rock. What have we got here? Well... We've got a cosplaying penguin in a dumb hat, a Ponzi ocelot, and a frog that looks like it's on crack. The popularity of Pokemon, and indeed the interest in the game, seems to have passed me by completely, and yet it is, of course, still very popular with the older demographic as to why I actually have no idea. But hey, it was probably about time that the main Pokemon series actually hopped on over to 3DS rather than sticking around on the DS, which, of course, was the system that had the most in the main series of Pokemon released on it by a country mile in comparison to the Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, and of course the original and venerable Game Boy. This also appears to be an indicator of the confidence that Nintendo have in their new system, since of course they are now releasing a game which has a significantly smaller audience due to the fact that many people are still using DS and DSi, which will not be compatible with the new release. Considering the 3DS's success in Japan up to this point, it is however somewhat unsurprising that they would be willing to bet a reasonable amount on the new system since it is selling a truckload across the board. All right, folks, that's me done for the day. Thank you very much for watching the content patch. I am, of course, done for the week on this show, and you will see me again on Monday the 14th with more gaming news and comment. Please have an enjoyable and safe weekend, and I will see you next time.